Uh, my name is Dr. Russell Dykstra. I'm a 1983 Hope grad, started a family medicine practice here 30 years ago. Delighted to be here to introduce Dr. Huffman, who I have seen as my, doc my eye doctor, by the way. He told me I could say that. And he's an experienced ophthalmologist. This time, last week, we focused on the effort of swimming the English Channel. Today, we'll hear about his success at doing that. Native of Michigan, University of Michigan for undergrad medical school, intern at St. Joseph Mercy in Ann Arbor, went to ophthalmology residency in the University of Florida's Shand Eye Center, and then happily returned here. And I was with Sight Eye Clinic. Um, he and his wife, Stacy have two school-aged children. When he's not busy in the office, you can usually find him working with his hands and fixing things. I like surgeons like that. He enjoys restoring classic cars with his father and loves being outdoors, spending plenty of time boating, lake, Great Lakes salmon fishing, biking, camping, hiking, and enjoying time with his family. We will take questions at the end. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hoffman. Thank you, Dr. Dykstra. So I must not have been too bad, done, done too bad last time. You know, a lot of you are back. So. <laughs> so for people that are new here this time, we talked a little bit last time about the history of swimming the English Channel. And I'll kind of finish up a little bit of that talk that I didn't quite get to. And then we'll talk about uh, my swim across uh, this last year. So um, last time we talked about a lot of the early swims, but one of the things that, and we talked about a little bit at the end, was the fact that the number of people swimming the English Channel has gone up steadily over time. Uh, if you look at the first few years, there were like one a decade, and now there's like a hundred a year that go across the English Channel. And so what's changed? Um, you know, uh, the channel itself hasn't changed. Why are more people making it across? Well, one is it's easier to get there, travel. You can fly over there in you know, a few hours and you're in England. Uh, makes it easier, but also the chances of getting across have gotten better because navigation has improved. We have GPS uh, GPS tracking, experienced captains that know know the tides and know what they're doing, more efficient courses, and the swim distances have actually gotten shorter for, for many of the swims over time because of those factors. Um, so is the speed. The speed has gotten faster over time, and some of that is just that swimming has gotten better. Uh, but some of it's these other factors. So this shows the the, the fastest crossing times over history. Um, for either direction. And so you can see at the beginning, they, you know, they drop by like hours at a time. Um, some of the first ones, you know, uh, Matthew Webb was the first one to go across. He held the record for the first few swims. Uh, Terabishi, as we talked about last time, swam from France to England, which is a little bit easier with the currents. And so he was able to swim faster. Gertrude Ederly was the first one who swam, swam a modified freestyle across. Everybody else had been breaststroke before that. So it's a much faster stroke. Uh, and then the times have just gotten faster over time. One of the interesting things on this list, I think, is that the overall speed record has been held four times by women. Uh, and women in, in uh, long distance swimming are very equal to men uh, for most events. In fact, most of the swimming events around the world, a lot of the first swims are women uh, to this day uh, is very common. Um, the queen of the channel we talked about last time has, had, has 44 crossings. The king of the channel has 34. Um, a lot of the categories are led by women to this day. Um, and uh, so one of them I would point out is, uh, uh, you know, the, you see the difference in the times starts to decrease as we get towards the bottom here. But one of the last big jumps was Penny Lee Dean, who was a great swimmer in the 70s, early 80s. And you can see she dropped the time by an hour um, just all of a sudden and held that record for quite a while. The channel's been swimming all four strokes, including butterfly the entire way across. <clears throat> the average time for swims has also decreased. So this plots the average time each year as you go through time and you can see they've dropped. And in recent years, they've actually kind of plateaued and maybe even gone up a little bit. This is women's times, this is men's, uh, but they're starting to taper off a little bit. Um, the average time now to cross is about 13 and a half hours, and that is actually an hour faster than Gertrude Ederle's world record 100 years ago. So the average time now is faster than the fastest time was then. Uh, the number of swims we talked about a little bit that you can see over you know decades here, there was one swim and then one a decade, 14, nine, and then the numbers start to go up, but now it's a little over 100 each year uh, to, uh, across the channel. And because of that increase in numbers, we talked a little bit at the end of the last time in the questions 
that France has regulated swims across. They were concerned about interfering with their port of Calais. So this is the port of Dover, which is much smaller. These are all semi trucks. This is a huge, big off ramp for semis to load onto ferries. There's usually, there are spots to dock eight ferries out there, and there's usually about five or six there loading with semis and just a continual stream of them going back and forth uh, between Calais, and Calais is a much busier port. Uh, they also limit the number of swims. Uh, there are two groups that take people across, the Channel Swimming Association and the Channel Swimming and Piloting Federation. Each one can have five boats out at any given time, so there can only be 10 boats out at a time or the French will send you back. Um, the odds of success. So there are about four to five spots on each boat for each neap tide, which lasts about a week. Uh, there are 10 neap tides a year. So there are about 500 spots a year for swimmers from all around the world. These are all the countries from which there have been swimmers. Uh, this is together men and women, women on the top, men on the bottom. Uh, but so people come from everywhere to book this. And it's currently booking three years out if you wanna swim the English Channel. Um, of those who book and pay the deposit to go across, which is about 1500 bucks, about 20% actually end up successful crossing the channel. Um, many of those have injuries or something else that comes up or just decide they're not gonna do it and don't show up. Um, some don't get a chance to swim because of weather. That is quite common. I talked to one guy who it was his fourth trip to England before he got a chance to swim across because of the weather. Just every time didn't allow a window for him to go across. But if you actually start swimming, it's about 50% that make it across. About a third of swimmers are Brits. It's right in their backyard. The next most pop, most common is Americans. We make up about 17%. Aussies at about eight, and then it drops down quite a bit from there. Interestingly to me, there are not a lot of French swimmers that go across. I don't know why. It's right in their backyard, too. But I think they don't like it. It's called the English Channel. Um, so by age, most swimmers are in their 20s and 30s. Um, they now don't allow people younger than 16 to go across. Uh, but then it decreases. The oldest swimmer is about 73. The current record for the youngest is 12. But like I said, they don't allow that anymore. Uh, but as you get older, definitely the numbers drop off fairly quickly. So I'm a grandpa in English Channel terms. Um, total number of swims. So to date, there are about 2,300 swimmers have crossed the English Channel. Um, the CSA only counts swimmers from their organization. So they give a lesser number. So you'll hear different numbers. But there have been about 2,300 that have soloed the English Channel. About two thirds of them men, about a third women. The early swims were mostly France to England, but they don't allow that anymore. And most of the swims have been in the last few decades. Um, so most of them are England to France. There have been 52 way crossings, 30 of those were women. Uh, there have been four three way crossing, half women, half men, and one four way crossing. Sarah Thomas, we talked about last week. Uh, she's the only one to have done it. There were 131 crossings last year, and I was the last one last year. Um, in comparison, Mount Everest has been summited set, uh, almost 7,000 times in half the amount of time. And 300, or sorry, 600 Americans have been to space. I'm the 301st American to cross the English Channel. Uh, so it's still not a lot of people that, that make it across or get a chance to go across. So now I'll transition a little bit to to my swim across. So this is our little, we made a logo, we had stickers, we had, we had merch gear. Uh, this is the team that went across with me. So you do need a team to get across. So myself and my wife, who's got her eyes closed, looks great in that picture. Uh, my friend, Paul Brinks, who I swim with all the time, and his wife, Marissa, who also swim with. This is my coach, Mike Daly, and friends of ours, John and Lori Van Dyke, that went with us as well. And all took three weeks to go to hang out in England with me. Uh, we talked a little bit last time about the four main challenges of swimming the channel, the distance, the currents, the temperature, and unpredictables. So the distance we talked about, the Straits of Dover is the shortest point across about 22 miles. And to train for that, part of the preparation, um, a lot of folks will say for this type of an event, you can't just go out and swim 20 miles every day. You'll get injured. Uh, it takes a long time to recover afterwards. But the ideally, I was I was working up to trying to swim that amount of time per week uh, when I reached the peak of my training. So as I worked up, 
Uh, by the end of my training over two years, I was swimming uh, 15 to 20 miles a week. Uh, and I'm actually right now in that same area. I'm trying to get over 20 miles this week uh, in. Um, by the time I had swam in two years, I swam 1,000 miles. I swam my thousandth mile in the English Channel before we went across uh, in preparation. Um, and that is the equivalent of swimming from Chicago through the, around the Straits of Mackinac, out through the Great Lakes to the St. Lawrence Seaway. I was just entering the St. Lawrence Seaway uh, when we entered England. Um, so it's a lot of swimming. Uh, we talked a little bit about the tides in England last time making the current. So this is Dover Harbor at low tide. Uh, they have floating docks and these giant pilings that look like they stick way up. And here you can see them again. Notice the angle of this ramp going down. And here's when the tide comes up and those pilings are a lot shorter and there's the ramp. And then we showed you Folkestone Harbor at high and low tide last time. Um, so the tides make strong currents. And because of that, uh, because of those strong currents, you want to be able to swim at a certain speed. If you're too slow, you're not going to be able to overcome the currents. So ideally, you want to be able to swim about two miles an hour, which was what I was shooting for. And that's a pretty typical, a little, little more, a little less. Uh, the really like the record holder swimmers swim at about three miles an hour. And so how do you do that? Well, I, I started working with Coach Daly, and most of it is actually trying to get more efficient in the water. Uh, people think swimming is all about getting more muscle so you can go faster, but actually speed in the water, 80% of it is drag reduction, only 20% is propulsion uh, for swimming. And so it's about getting flat in the water so you're not swimming like a plow, you're swimming on a plane and trying to reduce your drag and make your stroke as efficient as possible. Um, with all my swimming and to try to pick up speed, when I started swimming, I lost about 30 pounds over the first several months. And then I went on a nutrition program to try to get faster in the water and lost over my training, I lost 75 pounds. So this is me before with my one son, Quentin. This is me after with Barrett. Um, also, my heart rate for years had been about 60 beats per minute, and it had started creeping up to about 70. Um, now it's about 48 is my resting heart rate. Um, so it causes significant changes in your body as you start building more capillaries to muscles, um, started losing fat or gaining different kind of fat uh, to be more metabolically active. And that um, uh, you, you train your heart to beat more efficiently. So I was able to lower my heart rate and my blood pressure dropped about 30 points. I was actually taking some blood pressure medicine and don't need those anymore. Other things to practice um, are other you know, parts of swimming the channel. Half my channel swim was at night and that's pretty common. And so it's a little freaky swimming at night if you've never done it before. And there's a lot of things that are just kind of psychological for swimming. You know, it's the same thing. You're swimming in the top few feet of water regardless, but you get into deep water, you start seeing things moving in the water around you. And uh, you don't want to get in the middle of the of the channel and get freaked out and jump in the boat because then you're done. Um, so I did a lot of training swimming at night. Um, and a lot of it was my early morning swims. When I showed up in the middle of the summer at six in the morning at uh, Tunnel Park, it was light out. Uh, but by the time you get into October, it's pitch black until like 7, 730. Uh, and so I was swimming in just complete darkness. Uh, I had to like, it's actually kind of hard when you're leaving the swim area not to crash into the big uh, PVC pilings because <laughs> you can't see them. Um, working on feedings, uh, I actually did some training in saltwater, did some vacations. Uh, I went to Israel, I trained in the Mediterranean there and uh, in the Caribbean to get used to salt because that's definitely different. And then kind of getting out in deep water can be a little freaky. Um, so just doing some training with that as well. Temperature, we talked about a little bit last time um, that that's a big factor. Water can, uh, or uh, body heat loss is 24 times higher in water than air. And the channel averages 60 degrees. And we talked a little bit about this table that shows what your life expectancy is in cold water. When you get down into water below 40 degrees, you have about 15 to 30 minutes to live uh, in that temperature water if you don't do something to prepare for it or have something to keep you warmer in it. Uh, when you get up to 60, you've got a few hours, but you got to swim for you know, 12, 14, 16 hours to get across the channel. So it's doing something to prepare for that. And they do not allow wetsuits. Um, you can put grease, you can use goose fat, uh, which helps hold heat some, but it's a mess. 
Um, but you can, you are allowed to use that, but not a wetsuit. It has to be a textile swimsuit and no thermal protection. Uh, if you look at the success rate of going across the channel by month, in June, 0.7% per, uh, percent of the total swims ever done have been achieved in June. 20% in July, you can see August is the main month to go across because the water temperature is the warmest in August and the weather tends to be more calm. Uh, you tend to get more storms as you get into fall and spring. Uh, I went in October, 0.9% of the swims are successful in October. Um, the earliest and latest swims are the same guy in the same year. It was an unusually warm year. And he went across on May 16, which is ridiculously early, and November 3, which is ridiculously eight, or late. Uh, my swim, uh, there have only ever been 12 swims later in the year uh, in 150 years than October 11th, which is when I went across. So how do you train for the cold? Uh, cold adaptation training, uh, which is as fun as it sounds. Um, so ideally, you want to train in the conditions you're going to be swimming in. So some people will, you know, hop in ice baths or swim in, you know, 30 degree water. It's just more dangerous. It's not necessarily more effective. I think going a few degrees lower than what you're going to swim in is, is probably reasonable, but it doesn't have to be ridiculously cold. Um, so I tried to stay in, you know, the upper 50s and above. When I first started swimming, swimming in 60 degree water was horrible. Uh, I just get like an ice cream headache. It takes me probably an hour before and my teeth hurt uh, from the water. But over time, it's gotten better. I'm pretty comfortable in water in the upper 50s now. Um, it's a little, little cold when you first get in, but it always is. Um, to do the English Channel, you have to do a six-hour qualifying swim in sub-60 degree water. And last year before I went, I'd intended to do a spring, uh, swim early in the spring. My coach was gone. A few things happened. Didn't end up happening. And I thought, oh, there'll be a day the lake will flip and I'll have a cold day. We can go out and do this. Well, last year was very warm in Lake Michigan. I did a swim in July and it was 80 degrees. Um, and uh, um, so it never got cold enough. There was no place in the lower peninsula that was cold enough for me to swim under 60. So my son decided he was going to go to Michigan Tech last year. So we dropped him off at school in August. And I went up there to Lake Superior, way up in the Keweenaw Peninsula, about as far north as you can go. And Lake Superior was 51, uh, which was a little colder than I wanted. Uh, but I found this little place called Eagle Harbor, and the water there was about 58. So that was perfect. I swam a couple mornings, and then the third morning, we were going to do the swim. Well, the wind shifted. And Eagle Harbor was 53 uh, the morning I did my swim. And that is probably the coldest I have ever been. Um, you start looking for signs of hypothermia. Your fingers will start to curl up and you can't straighten them out. Uh, you start turning blue. You start not feeling cold, but warm. Um, and I was uh, starting to get the finger contracture. And I probably would have been more nervous about that. But I had bought this temperature monitoring system where you swallow a pill and it will tell you your core body temperature through a Bluetooth device. And my temperature never dropped while I was swimming, never dropped below one, de one degree from normal. Um, and so that made me a lot more comfortable of keep going that I wasn't gonna get in trouble and freeze to death. So us in Western society have very poor temperature tolerance because we don't need it. We live in air conditioning, we have heat in the winter, uh, we don't sit in you know teepees and freeze all the time or or vice versa out in the ex extreme heat. And so um, because of that, we're not very well adapted to warmth or or cold. Um, and this has some potential health issues. Uh, heat, uh, if you look at Scandinavian countries where they do a lot of saunaing, what you'll find is the rate of Alzheimer's is much lower there. And they've done studies on that. They believe, that heat shock proteins that are released from uh, uh, long uh, exposure to, to high heat actually help clean up cellular debris in your body. And there's some evidence that that may be fairly effective at decreasing rates of dementia. Cold also has health benefits. It improves immune function. Uh, folks uh, that have diabetes, it can improve insulin sensitivity and reduce rates of diabetes. And actually, it's quite good for some folks for chronic pain. 
Um, there are a lot of reports of people who do um, cold water immersion that have had chronic pain issues for years from accidents and find that that controls their pain better than medications or anything else. Uh, it's also very good for depression. It can be a treatment for depression that cold water immersion um, releases chemicals in the brain that help uh, long-term with depression issues. So there are a number of health benefits and it's kind of a big popular thing now. People put cold immersion tubs in their backyard or saunas and, uh, um, and use those. So it's kind of in vogue right now. If you look historically, um, Charles Darwin, uh, when he was on the Beagle down in South America, was uh, they were touring around and they ran into this tribe called the Yagan people. And they lived with nearly no clothes right at the very southern tip of South, South America, right down by Antarctica. And they adopted multiple um, ways of dealing with the cold. Uh, just as far as how they lived, they would huddle in small small groups with rock formations to shield them from the wind. The way they would rest is kind of in a crouching condition, a position that would decrease their surface area to the cold. But what they found is that group of people also had, um, had physiologic changes where they had higher metabolism than normal and were able to generate more heat than normal. So Darwin had seen this lady uh, feeding a child on a rock out on the snowy sh shore, and they were all in their heavy winter coats freezing. And here's this pretty much naked woman out there feeding a baby on a rock like it's nothing uh, because they were adapted to the cold. Um, you saw the same thing in the US when the pilgrims landed. Um, half of the pilgrims died the first year uh, from cold and starvation. Uh, some of that was the starvation part that the Native Americans knew how to how to gather food, but also a lot of it probably had to do with being cold adapted, that they were adapted to the environment that they lived in. So while the pilgrims had these, you know, wooden houses with chimneys and fireplaces, the Native American lived in these birch wigwams, not teepees in the winter because they knew to make something warmer. Um, but that's historically, if you go back, people were probably much better adapted to these things than we are today. And you can do things to make yourself adapted to that. So this is a Dutch guy named Wim Hof, and he's known as the Iceman. Uh, he's run a marathon, a half marathon, wearing nothing but uh, boxer shorts and barefoot in Finland. Uh, he, for a while, held the record for the longest uh, underwater swim under ice at 57.5 meters. Interesting to me, his first attempt failed because he didn't wear goggles and his corneas froze and he became temporary blind, passed out, couldn't find the other hole. And fortunately, they had a diver that hauled him up. His second attempt was successful. He also climbed Mount Everest to 24,300 feet in boxer shorts and sandals. At 22,000 feet, he had to put boots on because he had to affix crampons for the ice to climb the ice. Um, so this is an extreme. Uh, he has a whole method and actually several people have died using his method doing this meditation underwater. So I'm not promoting it, but, uh, but I would say you can train your body uh, to, to, to deal with cold and be very comfortable in cold. Uh, this gentleman, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name, Gulag, Gulagar, uh, is a fisherman from Iceland. And in 1984, in March, in Iceland, he was out with a group fishing. Their net snagged something on the bottom. It caused their boat to flip over, and the five crewmen all ended up in the water. Two died almost instantly from the cold. Probably had a heart attack, or uh, but died instantly. The, the other three um, started to swim toward shore. One was the other one was gone in about two minutes. Him and the captain, the captain made it about 30 minutes and then died. Um, Mr. Fjorbison swam for three and a half hours. At about three hours, he reached land where there was a lighthouse where he could see, and it was a sheer cliff going up. There was nowhere to get out. So he swam another half hour around the cliff to shore got on shore, walked a mile to the nearest uh, village over these jagged volcanic rocks. When he got there, he looked behind him and realized there was a trail of blood along the snow from his feet bleeding that he couldn't feel from being cut up by the rocks and survived. And he is a national hero in Iceland, which is a fishing nation where most fishermen, when you go in, you die. And he survived. He's the one the sea didn't claim. They did studies on him 
and found the reason he was able to survive is that in his body, he has about four to 10 millimeters of more dense than average fat evenly distributed around his body. His body more resembles a seal than an average person, and that gave him insulation to be able to survive um, about two to three times the normal amount of fat on the surface of his skin. This lady here is one of the a very well-known open water swimmer named Lynn Cox. Uh, she swam the Bering Strait between Alaska and Russia in 38 degree water. Um, she has also swam, this is a picture of her getting in the water in Antarctica. She swam a mile in Antarctica in 30 degree water. Um, it's the coldest water on earth. The salt and some other factors allow it to get below 32 and stay a liquid. Um, it's so cold that you have to be very careful because the water in your cells will start to freeze almost instantly because it's lower than the freezing point of water in our bodies. Um, and so she was able to do that. How was she able to do that? It is from continuous training in cold water. She is an extreme cold water swimmer. Um, most Americans have about, most American women have about 22 to 25% body fat. She has about 35%. And she has a large percentage of what's called brown fat. When babies are born, they have brown fat around their heart, their chest, their neck, and it helps generate heat because they have a large surface area related to their body size and they will freeze. And so this tissue helps to generate heat without shivering. And you can, we as adults, especially here in the West, lose our brown fat because we don't need it as we get older and it goes away, it atrophies but you can regain brown fat by training in cold water. And you can take white fat and convert it to what they call light brown fat. Essentially what makes it brown is it has mitochondria in the cells, which are the energy producing part of our cells and they generate heat. And its main function of brown fat in our body is thermogenesis to generate heat. If you look at Lynn Cox before she swims and my own data shows this as well, before I get into the water, before she gets into the water, her body temperature increases to nearly 101 degrees Fahrenheit in anticipation of getting in the water. And she maintains body temperature a degree higher than normal, uh, than her normal temperature when she is swimming in cold water because it turns on her thermogenesis and she's able to generate all that heat and then prevent losing the heat by this evenly distributed body fat. If you look at your typical elite athlete, so Michael Phelps, Katie Ledecky, two of the best swimmers in the world, both thin, tall, here is Lynn Cox, does not look like what many would consider an elite athlete, many would call her chubby, um, but she is an elite open water swimmer and can do things that these swimmers cannot do. These Olympians would probably freeze to death um, trying to swim the English Channel or something like that because they don't have enough body fat to, per, to maintain their temperature. Um, many people that are triathletes or things like that that try to swim the channel or other long swims try to gain about 20 to 30 pounds before they do their swim to help with heat retention. So our swim. So we arrived in England on September 27, my swim window. So you get a window of time to swim in was October 1 through October 8, and each boat books several swimmers. My boat had five spots open. I was swimmer number three in there. And the way they do it is swimmer number one gets the first swimmable day. Swimmer number two gets the second. You want to be as low on that list as you can. If you're up at swimmer four or five, it's pretty iffy if you're going to go. Swimmer three was kind of on the bubble for that swim window to get across. Um, so initially, I was swimmer number three. Captains of our boat were Ray and uh, Reg Brickle. Uh, they're second generation, uh, not channel swimmers, channel pilots. Uh, their father did it. They did it as kids with him. They were fishermen in the, in the channel for their whole lives. They've been doing it for 50 years. We stayed in this house in Sandgate, just down from Folkestone. Uh, this was a Lord Ragnar's house, his summer home, and a lady owns this and lives in the bottom two floors, and she rents out the top two floors, so we rented that out for our team. And this is our seven-passenger vehicle by European standards. <laughs> There's the team. Everyone except for Marissa was not able to come because they had some family issues, so they were all packed into the car. Uh, there's the house from, from the channel side. 
And the day we arrived was beautiful. Uh, we got there. We had been up. I don't sleep well in planes. I've been up all night. Um, we got there. We had to drive from London down to the shore. We had a traffic jam. So by the time we got there, it was about 630 at night. Absolutely flat, calm, perfect day. Called the captain, let him know we're in town. And I figured we'd have a few days to acclimate to going. And his first question does, do you want to swim tomorrow? And by tomorrow, I mean, you need to be the docks at 1130 tonight uh, to leave at midnight. Um, and I'm like, I, I, I don't think we can do that. My team wasn't there. The only one there was Coach Mike and my wife. Uh, we didn't know where the docks were, hadn't slept. We hadn't ate that night. So we talked about it. One of my biggest fears was not having a chance to, to swim. And I'd heard of other people that had the same issue where you get there and the best day is the day you arrive when you're jet lagged and everything. And uh, do you pass on it and then maybe not get another day? So we looked at the weather forecast. We figured, all right, I think we're going to be all right. We passed. So did everybody else. Uh, nobody on our boat went that next day. That was the next, the first day of our swim window, uh, October 1st. Uh, out in the middle of the channel, I think that at different times there were seven, eight foot waves, 40, 50 mile an hour winds. Uh, the weather was terrible. Uh, we went and visited Captain Reg, saw the boat, met everyone. I was kind of hoping to go October 3rd, which is my birthday, would be really cool. Well, October 3rd was a beautiful day, and the first swimmer on all the boats went out, and several people made it across that day, um, which was great. So one swimmer was gone, and we found out that night that the second swimmer had dropped out. So I was now suddenly next. So things were looking very good for getting a shot of going across on the neap tide. This was the next day, uh, the 7th, the 8th, the weather just kept being terrible. Um, while we were there, we swam in Dover Harbor, or if the weather wasn't terrible, we'd swim along the shore by where we rented our place. Dover Harbor is quite protected, and so a lot of channel swimmers will swim there in the harbor as the ferries come in and out. The channel boats are all on these dock areas over here. They have um, cruise ships and stuff, but we basically swam right along the shore a lot of the days. Uh, for training swims. But the weather kept being rough and crappy the whole time. And pretty soon, my whole swim window had come and gone. Uh, got to be the eighth. We did not have a swimmable day. The only day was the day swimmer one left. So by then, a bunch of my team had to leave. Uh, Coach Mike's daughter was getting married in Morocco, so he had to leave. Paul was going to go back. So it was just Stacy, my wife, and my friend John and Lori that were that were there and able to stay with us. Um, Paul went up to visit a friend of ours. I think I talked about a little bit before, Nick Hobson is wearing the shirt from the Memorial Swim for him who had passed away in a swim in New Zealand. His parents live in Scotland and Paul was really good friends with him. So went up to visit them. In the meantime, we toured around England. We toured around England the whole time we were there. It was great. Uh, one of the places we went was St. Martin's Church which is the oldest church in the English speaking world. It was founded in 450 AD. It is where, where Queen Bertha of England greeted St. Augustine when he came to England and founded what ultimately became Canterbury Cathedral just down the road. Uh, and we actually attended church there, it was great. So the four P's of success, uh, I think for a lot of things, um, the preparation. So in going to try to do the channel, I did a lot of studying about the channel, reading every book I could find about someone who went across to kind of know what to expect. Practice, we had done that before we went there. Perseverance of getting across the channel, we'll talk about. And then I would say prayer, and I would lump people in with that, because I think part of prayer is letting other people know that they can be the hands of God to help you in whatever you're trying to do. And so when we went to St. Martin's Church, the people there heard what we were doing, were praying for us, but so was a lot of people back home that knew we were trying to get across. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later. So um, part of that prayer was we got a swim date. Um, so we found out on about the, the 9th, it looked like the 11th was going to be good. And by the 10th, we knew we were going to go on the 11th. Paul was still in England and decided that he was going to come back now that we had a for sure date. Not only that, his wife, Marissa, decided to fly over for the day uh, to go across the channel. So they both arrived on the 10th. And this is us at the docks in Dover at midnight on the 11th to leave on the swim. 
Uh, the swim started at 11.15 in the morning. It was 45 degrees outside. The water was 64. Um, this is me getting in the dinghy to go to shore uh, with Captain Ray took me in. Uh, they're very big about safety, uh, which we were very concerned about after what happened to our friend Nick. There is always someone on the boat within feet of you as you go across. Even, you know, I could have swam into shore and swam out to the boat. They have a dinghy go in with you on both ends to make sure there's always someone there. So that little dot is me getting ready to start and the light from the ship uh, pointing into our shore and then swimming out to the boat. Uh, one of the guys I talked about in the 50s, the shortest swim ever went 100 yards and stopped. You could understand that when you go to get in the water because up until then it was like, sweet, I'm gonna swim the English Channel. This is gonna be great when I'm done. Then all of a sudden you're standing there like, crap, I gotta swim the English Channel. <laughs> Like I had some real thoughts about swimming to the boat and getting out and saying I was done um, because it didn't seem quite so cool at that point in time. So we kept swimming. You can see it is pitch black outside. There are lights on the side of the boat on the rail that shine down on the water on where I would be swimming so that they can see me. And I have lights on. There's one light on the back of my head. You can see lit up here. There's one on the back of my suit. And then it was actually kind of nice. I prefer to swim on the opposite side of the boat because I breathe to my right. Well, they can use the boat to block the waves is, is legal. And so they'll do that. So they wanted me on the other side of the boat, which is not my breathing side. And I knew that you know, ideally you try to be able to breathe on both sides, but it, 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 I'm very much a right breather. And so one of the ways I could tell where I was by seeing when it started getting dark, I was getting too far away and it was time to swim back. So there's the ladies all with their warm tea in the 40 some degree morning, all bundled up, freezing. Um, this was at 2.30 in the morning. We had made it quite a ways offshore. Um, and uh, this was the other boat that went out with us the same morning, the masterpiece. This is about as far as they made it. And then they turned around. So then it was just us after that. Um, by 4.30, so I'd been swimming about three hours, at about two, a little over two hours, I made the beginning of the first shipping channel that we talked about a little bit before, and which was a pretty good time for that. I was making good progress, feeling really good. This is the boat traffic in the channel at 4.30 in the morning as we're going across, and here is us partway across the channel here, kind of nearing the end of the first shipping channel. And I'd been feeling great up to this time, as it started we're getting into the chipping channel, you could start to see ships. This is that oil tanker passing behind us um, at, at navigating around us. I was feeling pretty good. And then I wasn't feeling so good. Uh, about the time I end, uh, reached the end of the first shipping lane, started not feeling great, a little nauseous, stopped for a feeding, took the feeding, started swimming, and immediately threw up everything I had just taken in. Um, nobody on the boat really knew because I just breathe, throw up, breathe, throw up. You can't really see that from the boat. Um, and then I felt a lot better after I threw up. So I thought, all right, hopefully that's it. I'm doing all right. Kept swimming. Um, there's a jellyfish that we saw in the water. Did not get any stings. So the next feeding, I wasn't feeling so good again. Kind of let the boat know I was feeling kind of nauseous. And pacers can get in and swim with you for an hour at a time. They can't, you can't draft off them or anything, but they can just swim to kind of keep you company going across. And I thought, oh, this would be a great opportunity for my friend, swim part of the English Channel. Really didn't think it was going to be that helpful for me. Well, it ended up being a huge help for me uh, to have him there. But um, so this was Paul. The, the pacers can wear fins, wetsuit, whatever they want. It doesn't matter. So Paul put a wetsuit on. We're normally pretty evenly paced when we swim. When he's got a wetsuit, he's definitely faster than me. A wetsuit adds about 15 to 20% to your speed in the water. Um, and so Paul jumped in. I love this picture because it looks like he's walking on water. <laughs> and we started swimming and I was not feeling good at this point. And like I said, usually Paul and I are even, you can see Paul looking back like, where is he? Uh, he kept having to stop. He kept, you're not supposed to swim in front of me. He kept having a hard time uh, staying behind me because I was feeling lousy. And then Paul finished his first swim. And by then, um, when at the end of his first 
period of swimming with me, I took another feeding and then immediately just threw up everything in my stomach right in front of everybody on the boat. Like it went in and just came right back out. And then everybody knew there's a problem. And you can see the worried look on Marissa's face. Um, I didn't know this from the captain at the time, but they said, yeah, usually once they start throwing up, it's about a half an hour to an hour and you're done. Um, and I was feeling terrible. I was 100% sure I was not going to make it across the English Channel. And this is where that last P of, of prayer and people comes in, because as I was swimming, I was thinking, you know, I kind of figured if I got a chance on a decent day, I was going to make it across uh, and, and be able to get to the other side. And all of a sudden it was looking like this is not going to happen. And I had a whole team of people uh, rooting for me back home. I just dragged half my, you know, bunch of my friends halfway around the world to go stay here for a week. And then I'm going to quit and fail. Um, I figured if I failed, it was probably going to be that I got to the other coast and missed the point and got in a current that pulled me out. And it was just going to be a treadmill where there was absolutely no way of finishing. I never dawned on me that I would quit halfway across the channel. And so as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, well, this sucks what I'm doing now. Um, you know, I feel terrible, but it's going to suck more going back and telling everybody that I quit halfway around across the channel. And I think if it wouldn't have been for all of those people that I probably wouldn't have made it across. So the next time Paul got in, the, the team on the boat had been telling me, like, you need to hurry up. The captain and uh, the mate were telling me, um, you need to go faster because we're going to miss Point Grenet in France, and then you're going to get sucked out to sea, and you're not going to finish. Um, by the time Paul got in the second time, they had already told me, you missed the point. That's You're not going to make that. You're going to have hours more swimming. Um, and But, you know, there still was a chance I could make it, but it was not looking like this was going to be a, a, a good thing. Um, so Paul got in, and instead of telling me to swim faster, he told me what my coach and I had been working on all along is swim more efficiently. And that changed things for me. My team also changed my feedings. I had a whole feeding regimen of what I was doing. And we'd been doing that same thing all along. And they decided this is not working. We need to do something different. So they put some ginger ale in my feeding, uh, changed around what they were giving me. And my stomach started not feeling completely terrible. Uh, Paul jumped in and the next hour with Paul, actually swam pretty decently, um, started stretching out my strokes and getting a little longer. And then Paul got out and I kept swimming and kept feeling better and better as the feeling feedings changed. By the time Paul got in for the third time, he told me that the captains had said, if like we need to go, this is, this is it. This section is the make or break part. We're not taking us feeding at 30 minutes. We're going to go the whole hour and we need to haul or we're going to miss the point. But if we move, we might be able to make it. And this was the first that I heard that, like, that was a possibility we might make the point and it would uh, drastically shorten how much I had to swim yet, which sounded really good at that point in time. So we went like crazy and I kept up with Paul really well for the whole time. We had skipped that feeding and I was concerned that skipping the feedings, I would end up at some point crashing from not having, I basically hadn't eaten for like four hours now. Um, and you got to eat going across or you'll run out of glucose and you won't be able, you won't be able to continue. So by the end of this swim with Paul, the last 10 minutes, I could start to feel I was starting to get tired. They call it bonking in sports where you start running out of sugars. So we stopped and the captain said, that was great. You did wonderful. And I was hoping that we got enough that we're going to make the point and we can cruise from here. He's like, that was wonderful. If you keep that up for another hour, we just might make it. So Paul got out and I kept swimming. And pretty soon I could see France. And at first, so at that point, I was caught in La Barriere current that's moving at about six miles an hour. The current suddenly switches. And I did not know I was going to make the point until we basically were there to this point, essentially. Uh, right about now, the dinghy is going to pull around in front of me to help take me into shore. But the last feeding, the captains do not tell you how far you are until you get to the last feeding. And they will tell you this is the last feeding. And then you know you're within a half hour of shore. Um, and so before that, I was watching houses go by like this on the shore. As I'm swimming straight towards shore, they're just sailing by. And I'm like, are we going to make this point or not? Um, so we made the point by about 10 minutes, 
10 minutes longer, I would have missed it. And they said uh, they've had people miss the point by 25 yards and swim another six hours after that. So the shore on the beach there are all rocks and they hurt your feet when you get out. So as we went up to shore, uh, let's see, I think this is a video. There we go, I'll show the video. As you get up to shore, I was kind of looking for a spot that maybe wasn't just all rocks that I could get out on. And I had read yep. that when you get to shore, don't try to stand up because you won't be able to stand up. And you'll see me as I get to shore that that is true. You can't stand up. <laughs> so Ray took me in on the dinghy, uh, got me to shore. And then I think I'm right about soon in here, he's going to stop me and tell me when I'm there to pick up some rocks as a souvenir off the shore, yep. which was a great suggestion because I never would have thought of that at the time. So we come in and I'll let this run a minute and show you the, the ending here, but you'll see me get out very ungracefully, crawl out of the water. I found this kind of sloped, smooth rock that wasn't all these sharp stones and stood up and immediately fell over about three times before I finally made it standing up. So here's coming in. There's Ray talking to me, telling me how far to go, but... Um, so yeah, I had swam all through the night. Um, you know, this is the next day. And up on this point here, there's a lighthouse. You can't really see it from any of these pictures, but there'll be a, there's a lighthouse up there. And there's a, um, a observatory that the Coast Guard uses from France to watch ships and things. They launch their rescue missions and stuff from there. Yeah, everybody talking on the boat. So everybody on the boat was really I mean, happy as me. I was super emotional when I got to the end because I was, you know, a few hours early, uh, earlier, 100% sure I wasn't going to make it. And then it was looking like it was possible, but still not likely. And yep, there I am crawling up on the rock. Super graceful. And he's down. <laughs> <laughs> Try number two. Can't hardly walk. So they honk the horn on the boat when you start to tell you to go. And then as soon as they feel you've cleared the water under your own power. On the third... The day that people had gone across, one girl went across, got to the other side, and was so delirious by the time she got to shore, she got to shore and just kept swimming on the rocks, couldn't clear the water, and did not get credit for her swim across. So there's the end. So then I came back to the boat. I was hoping, so we ended up going, not in the neap tide when you wanna go along, the currents are the lowest, but right at the very peak of the spring tide, which is the hardest time to get across. And I was thinking, I was kind of figuring my time going across initially might be like 12 to 16 hour range. And then when I found out we're gonna go on the peak of the spring tide, I was figuring it was gonna be like 16 hours or something. So I ended up finishing in 12 hours and 19 minutes. And my goal was to beat Gertrude Ederle's time of 14 and a half hours. So I beat that by over, over two hours. So I was thrilled with my time after throwing up and spring tides and everything else. So there's the team on the boat, all happy, including me being happy and tired. Uh, there's the captains of the boat, Reg and Ray. And there's our course going across. So this little tail on the end is the boat heading back to course, or to, to, to the uh, port. Uh, but you can see we left over. Here's where we started. Went across, the tide shifted. And then you can see La Barriere. The tide just swings around very rapidly on the French side. And there's the point right there. If we'd been a little farther, we would have missed that because it starts pulling you not this way, but this way out to sea and it pulls you farther away from shore if you miss it. So what do you get when you swim the English Channel? Uh, well, you can get a certificate, you have to pay for it, uh, but you get a certificate. You get to post, if any of you know what Strava is, it's like a social media app for bikers and runners and there's some swimming stuff on there, but you get to post on Strava that you just swam the English Channel. Um, and uh, there's a bar in Dover called the White Horse, 
where swimmers for decades have gone and signed the wall after their swim. The only way you can sign the wall is swimming the English Channel. And those are signatures of decades of swimmers that have swam across. Unfortunately, the white horse does not allow signatures anymore. Uh, the walls are all full. Someone might have snuck a signature on the wall there. <laughs> we went back in April for an awards ceremony and this wall had some kind of water leak and they had to replaster it. So all of the signatures on that wall were gone, including mine. I didn't put a new one on. But fortunately, there's a new bar. La Fleur, new being 1837, uh, when they were established, that swimmers go to sign the wall. And I was really hoping to sign the white horse. I'd heard about this for years, so I was kind of bummed when I didn't get to, but it was really cool to sign at La Fleur. So there's me signing the ceiling at La Fleur and my signature there, hopefully forever, of making it across. They write their dates backwards there, so it's the 11th of October. And I was kind of bummed about, eh, it's like the second best place till I started looking around. That's Sarah Thomas, Four Crossings, signed there, and Chloe McArdle, Queen of the Channel, all her sig signatures. And I thought, oh, this is pretty cool, actually. Uh, you get your name on the list. So this is their website. You can go on there. You can find my name on the Channel Swimming Association list and my time going across. And I was the top one on that list for eight months until the next person made it across on June 11th. Uh, we got tour around London. Got my, uh, I got an article on the front page of the paper about a month later. That was pretty cool. Never been on the front of the paper before. And then actually I was fortunate enough being the last swim, they award a trophy each year for the earliest or latest swim. It's the farthest from August 22, I think is the middle of the season. So I was the latest, I was two days later than the earliest person was early. So I got the Derek Turner trophy and there's me and Captain Reg. Um, this is the Channel Swimming Association president, the mayor of Folkestone. This is the big regalia they wear there for the being the, the mayor. And then uh, Michael Reed, who has 33 crossings. He's the king of the channel, according to the CSA. And then I got a personalized plate for my light, my, my truck. So. so what next? So there's other swims around the world besides the English Channel. Uh, one is called the Triple Crown which is the English Channel, the Catalina Channel in California, and the 20 Bridges Swim around the island of Manhattan in New York. So this is an outline of the 20 Bridges. I'm actually signed up for the 20 Bridges Swim on September 28. I'll be swimming that. You actually have to apply and get a spot. Uh, if you do all three of those plus Tampa Bay, they call that the Grand Slam. And then there's Lake Tahoe is the other big one in the U.S., there's the Bosphorus Transcontinental Swim in Turkey between Europe and Asia. Uh, there's thousands of people that go to that. You have to apply to get a spot there as well. And then there's what's called the Ocean Seven, which has kind of for years been the big one, um, which is seven swims all around the world. The English Channel, the North Channel between Scotland and Ireland, the Catalina Cat Channel off from California, the Molokai Strait between two of the Hawaiian Islands, uh, Oahu and um, Lanai, I believe it is, which is 28 miles. That's the longest of them. The Straits of Gibraltar is the shortest at eight. The Cook Strait, 16 miles. And then the uh, Suguri Strait between two islands of Japan. Those seven swims together make up the ocean's seven. They also have what's called the Stillwater Eight, which no one has ever completed yet. Uh, I think the most swims completed on this is five by anyone. Swims all over the world with unique challenges. Loch Ness is 50 degrees, very cold. Uh, Lake Tahoe, you have altitude issues. Um, Lake uh, Taupo in, in New Zealand. Lake Ontario is the longest of them at uh, 30, almost 32 miles. Uh, Titicaca is the highest navigable lake, commercial lake in the world. Um, so you have altitude issues there. And this is the one that scares me, Malawi, Africa, wildlife. Um, not about getting eaten. Uh, get, see a galley sounds pretty cool. I might do that one. And then you have right here in our backyard, the Great Lakes. Only four people have swum all five Great Lakes. Only three are recognized by the Marathon Swim Federation because Jim Dreyer wore a wetsuit for all of his swims and wetsuits are not allowed. So none of his swims are recognized. Vicki Keith in 1988 swam all five Great Lakes in two months at age 27 including Lake Ontario butterfly the entire way across. 
She raised $540,000 in 1988 for a, a camp that teaches disabled kids how to swim. Uh, the following year, she swam both the English and the Catalina Channel All Butterfly and raised another $250,000. Uh, Jim Dreyer, a lot of people here know about over between 98 and 2005. He swam all five Great Lakes, um, and uh, but did use a wetsuit so they don't recognize it in the Ma Channel uh, or the Marathon Swim Federation. Another Canadian woman named Paula Stevenson swam all five Great Lakes over several years between 86 and 2009. And then Elizabeth Fry just completed it last year, actually, to little fanfare, a very accomplished swimmer. She's done the Triple Crown. She's done the Ocean Seven. I think she's like four or five of the Stillwater Eight swims. Um, and she swam all five Great Lakes. So very accomplished uh, swimmer. And she did the Great Lakes between ages 58 and 63. So Lake Michigan, um, we're planning on swimming in a couple of weeks. Uh, many of you have probably heard. Um, so between August 11 and 13, I'm hoping to cross Lake Michigan between Raleigh Point, Wisconsin to Ludington State Park, uh, 51 mile crossing, which is twice as long as the English Channel. So you don't have the currents, the temperature shouldn't be such an issue, but the length is daunting for the Great Lakes. Uh, this would be the first swim recognized between Michigan and Wisconsin. Dreyer swam, oops, that same path um, when he went across, but because of the wetsuit, they don't recognize it. Um, only, uh, only 20 swims in history will have been longer than this if I make it across. Uh, interestingly, uh, six of the top 25 swims, uh, that there's only been 25 swims greater than or equal to 50 miles ever. Uh, six of them are on the Great Lakes, four on Lake Michigan, and two double crossings of Lake Ontario, uh, one being Vicki Keith, who did the double crossing all butterfly as well. So Lake Michigan has been crossed by seven to nine people, depending on how you do the math. So in the 1950s, you may recall from my last talk, um, they had these races across the English Channel. And marathon swimming was a big thing kind of around the world. He's got a lot of publicity. And there was a guy in Chicago named Jim Moran, who was a car dealer and a very successful car dealer. He had the largest Hudson dealer in the world. When Hudson went out of business, he started a Ford dealership, became the largest Ford dealership in the world. When he retired, he moved to Florida and he opened the largest Pontiac dealer in the world. He retired a billionaire. Uh, he was an avid racquetball player in the 1950s. And in 1951, two of his best friends had massive heart attacks while playing racquetball. And his wife said, you're not playing racquetball anymore. You need to find something else. So he found swimming. And he started swimming and he read about these big races at the English Channel and other places and thought, we can do one of those here. So he put up $3,700 for the first person who could swim across Lake Michigan from Chicago to Michigan City, the very southern tip of Lake Michigan. They had swims in 57 through 60. No one made it across on any of them. One guy tried four times. The last time he ended up in the hospital and he said, I will never talk about swimming that lake again. Um, in 1960, they held another one. Uh, several swimmers, including one named Margaret Ravallo, who was a big open water swim, swimmer, entered. They had a specific date they did it. Well, that day a big storm came in. There were five foot waves. One swimmer made it across, Ted Erickson. Totally unknown guy before that, became the first one to cross Lake Michigan, uh, became fairly well known in the swimming community there. Uh, the boat actually lost him for about five minutes going across in the waves. They were totally terrified that he died at sea, but they found him uh, and hauled him back in. The next year, they had a Lake Michigan challenge again. Um, and uh, three swimmers did a swim along the coast. So sometimes people call this a crossing. Some don't. It's long enough to be a crossing. But a guy named Dennis Modic uh, swam 37 miles between Chicago and Waukegan, which is up in here somewhere. And then Greta Anderson, who you may remember from the English Channel talk, she was an Olympic gold medalist. Uh, her and Ted Erickson made it up to Waukegan uh, um, uh, and their swim 37 miles. Um, so that, that's one of the swims that's longer than, sorry, Waukegan was farther, 50, uh, Kenosha, they went to Kenosha, which was 50 miles. So that's one of the 50 mile swims. 
Uh, the following year in 63, they did another Lake Michigan challenge, this time from Chicago to Benton Harbor with 60 miles. Um, that's still the longest swim on Lake Michigan. It was the longest, it is still the longest swimming race ever. And it was the longest swim in the world for about 15 years until Ted Erickson's son, John, did a double crossing or did a triple crossing of the English Channel uh, and took his father's record. Um, so uh, Ted Erickson and Abdel Latif Abdul Heif, who was one of the members of the Egyptian swimming team from the English Channel in the 50s, um, he went across. So he held the English Channel speed record for three years. Ted Erickson, was the second person to do a double crossing of the English Channel. He held the speed record for that. His son, John Erickson, was the next one to cross in 1980 from Chicago to Michigan City. He was the first to do a triple crossing of the English Channel uh, and also held the double crossing speed record. And then the other four are the ones who all swam all five Great Lakes, Vicki Keith, Jim Dreyer, uh, Paula Stevenson, and Elizabeth Fry. So the list of people that went across is, is pretty humbling, actually. Oh, I broke it. Oh, come on, advance. Oh, there it'll advance. So why? So a lot of people that do... English Channel Crossings do a lot of fundraising with it. We kind of had a little fundraising site that you could donate when I went across, but it wasn't really my, it's kind of a personal goal I wanted to do, and we didn't really have a big emphasis on fundraising. But then when I looked at doing other swims, kind of felt like there should be a bigger cause other than just going across a lake somewhere. And so we decided to partner with the Holland Aquatic Center to fund swim lessons for kids. So with reading about Lake Michigan and Vicki Keith was able to raise, she's raised over a million dollars over her swimming career for teaching kids to swim. Um, I knew I couldn't do that kind of fundraising on my own. And so I have a whole team at the aquatic center that will be, that's helping with that. But drowning, a lot of people don't think about it, but it's the number one cause of death in the United States for kids one to four. It's number two, between two and 15 behind car accidents. And um, so it happens all the time. Lake Michigan's the deadliest great lake. 75 to 100 people will drown on Lake Michigan this year um, and, and do every year. And a single session of swim lessons in kids one to four decreases the risk of drowning by 88%. So it makes a big difference. So the initial goal was just to help fund the swim school, which helps to uh, local kids have a week in elementary school where they go to the pool, they do swim lessons for a week, typically underfunded. And so the idea is to help fund that and then to provide scholarships for kids who come and can't afford swim lessons that they can get them. But the ultimate goal through this and maybe a few other swims is to try to make it, my ultimate goal would be that if kids can come and get swim lessons for free forever, we can start an endowment to be able to do that. So that's my ultimate goal. Um, but we've raised a fair amount already. I think we're over $20,000 now uh, for which will exceeded our initial goal. So we're hoping to raise more, but that's the, the main purpose for, they're calling it Brian's Big Lake Swim. Um, and when we leave, we'll depend on weather. Um, and uh, we need a pretty flat lake with ideally a nice little breeze out of the West to help push me across. Um, hopefully not five foot waves um, like Ted Erickson swam through, um, but we're hoping to make it across for that. And if people are interested in donating, you can go to the Holland Aquatic Center's website is the easiest way. You can go online and donate there, hollandaquatic.org. And then right on the front page is Brian's Big Lake Swim. So I think that is it. So I'll open it up to questions. Hey, Brian. So. Hi. Two questions. Number one, could you explain what you ate and how it was fed to you? Yeah. And number two, when they do, um, how long it took you to do it? It's from when the horn goes off in the boat, when you get, but then when, like, when did they say you were officially finished? Yep. So you have to clear the water. 
under your own power. So you have you can crawl, you can roll, whatever you need, but you have to get past the edge of the water. Is the the rules for both the English Channel and the and the Marathon Swim Federation. For eating, people do all different things. So we talked about the first swim. Matthew Webb drank brandy, uh, which is not on most people's feeding protocols nowadays, but. Um, I had used a, a mix from a company called Hammer Nutrition that does sports, uh, just sports nutrition stuff. And it's uh, essentially a powder you mix with, with water. It's got complex carbohydrates. You don't want just sugar because you get a big spike and then it drops. It also shuts off your body's um, uh, uh, metabolism of fat. So if you eat a lot of sugar, your insulin levels go up and your body starts taking sugar out of your bloodstream and wants to store it as fat, it shuts off your metabolism of fat for energy. With a swim like the English Channel or any of these that are really long, you cannot digest the number of calories that you're burning going across. So for I calculated for my English Channel swim, I burned 14,000 calories. Even if I could physically eat that much, your gut shuts off. It's sending all the blood to your muscles. So you don't metabolize stuff. And so you can't absorb it all. And so you rely on body fat. Uh, is You want to take in some protein so you don't start breaking down your muscle, but it's mostly fat. And even super lean athletes have, you have thousands and thousands of calories of fat in your body that you can metabolize and absorb. And so you don't want to shut that off with big spikes in your insulin. So this has a, this stuff has a mixture of complex carbohydrates and a little bit of protein, uh, which sounds great. But then when I was actually doing it, one of the things with the English channel, the currents are so strong, especially at the beginning, you want to have your feedings be very fast, like 20 seconds or less. And I had heard that. I thought, eh, you know, what's the big deal? I'll take a minute. Um, every, the captain told us there, every minute you, st you stop, you lose 10 minutes of swimming. Um, so if you do a three minute stop, every half hour, you're going nowhere, you're going to stay in the same spot. So you need to do your feedings really fast. And that's part of what got me in trouble. Uh, part of it, I think maybe was seasick from the waves, although that's usually not a big issue for me. I think a lot of it was the salt. Um, you're taking a lot of salt. My tongue was swollen for three days. Um, it tasted like I had a brick of salt in my mouth for days and anything with salt on it, like salty fries was like eating razor blades. It was just burned when it went in your mouth. Um, and so I had this mixture and I had used it on other swims, but we stopped a lot longer to feed. And I think part of my issue was it was just too much volume. I was trying to chug this whole thing down as fast as I could and then immediately start swimming again. And that doesn't work. Yeah, so sorry, it's in a water bottle with a rope attached to it. And so they'll they signal me that it's time for a feeding. Uh, they toss the water bottle into me. I drink it, let it go. They pull it back into the boat with the rope. So you have to tread water the whole time. Yeah, I, I have a lot of questions. Hopefully some are applying to other people too. Why did you wait until October if that's one of the most difficult? Okay, that's one. Um, how does Stacy, your wife, feel about all this? Um, I would be terrified if I was on that boat watching my husband in the water. Um, oh, I had a couple more. Um, one was, this seems like a very, um, and you might not want to comment on this, but a very expensive sport to be involved in. There must be a lot of ancillary expenses that you that you have to deal with. And what do you think about when you're swimming? Do you do you, are you constantly assessing your your body, and or, or does your mind actually wander when yeah. you're in that water? Uh, I'm trying to what was the first one again? Uh, <laughs> Too many. I forgot. I don't know. Oh, October. Why? October? Yeah. Why October? Oh yeah. So, um, like I said, they're booking out three years for the English Channel. I didn't really realize that for sure when I was looking at doing it. So I started swimming at the end of the year, swam through into about October. And did my uh, my goal was to tr swim the length of Lake Makatawa by the end of that first year. So I did that and decided, you know what? I think I can do the English Channel. I'm going to sign up. So I went, looked at how you signed up, and called captains, and uh, and quickly realized that they're booking out not for a year or two. I was looking at doing it in two years, and um, pretty much all those spots were full. Pretty much every boat captain called me back and said they're all taken. 
uh, there were a few spots that were available. And so I didn't want to wait at that time to go a whole nother year of training for it. So I wanted to try to do it in two years from then. Um, they had a spot on June 11th. And I looked up what the water temperature was June 11th. And the average water temperature is like 54 and decided that doesn't sound like a very good date. And then they had the first week of October. And some of them, they had spots at other places, but it was the fifth swimmer uh, where you're unlikely to get a shot to go. So it was the best date I could get two years out, essentially. Um, the cost when you sign up, it's about... The deposit, I want to say, was about $1,500. It's it's uh, like, I forget what it is, 1,200 pounds. And you have to send it in pounds. Uh, so you have to go to the bank and make a transfer. Um, and then the total, you have to pay the rest when you get there to the captain. So when you leave on the boat, you need to have cash in hand. Uh, they say no, well, I forget what the saying was, no, no, I don't know. No, anyway, no cash, no swim, basically. And uh, so they count the cash there and you take off, but it's about 5,000 bucks by the time you pay. Most of it's the boat captain because uh, you're renting a boat for a whole day and all the fuel to go across and back, which is a lot of fuel. So it's about five grand to, to pay the captain. And then the Channel Swimming Association, you pay a fee to them and that covers an observer on the boat uh, that watches you. Um, but the main expense is a three week trip to England. Um, as you can go over there, it doesn't work. Some swims like my swim for New York, my swim is September 28th and the backup day is September 29th and that's it. Um, so you have an exact date you're going. I basically go to a weekend for, for New York and I'm back. Uh, the English channel doesn't work that way uh, because of signing up way back and waits for each boat and the weather being unpredictable. I had heard you wanna get there before and you want to stay after and be available to swim during those times so that if you don't end up getting to swim in your swim window, you can get a shot in a spring tide, even though it's a it's a more difficult time to swim, at least you get a shot. Um, if you don't go, so at the end of this, the neap tide, if I decided I was going home and waiting for the next tide, they hold your deposit, they'll give you the next available spot, which I think is in three years. Um, and then you don't pay the rest of the money till you go. Um, but I think for a lot of swimmers like me, you know, the, the big expense was going over there, taking three weeks off from work, renting a house in England for three weeks for myself and my whole team to go. So that's where the main expense of it is really. Uh, and other swims are about the same. The 20 bridges swim, it's about five grand for the boat, but the whole team, they provide a boat, a kayak, a whole team, the whole deal set up for you. Um, it, I think that's kind of the, the going rate from what I've seen so far for, for these bigger swims like that. Um, my wife, what does she think? Uh, I think most people think I'm a little crazy, which is probably true. Uh, we always joke that, you know, how did I get into this? It's because you know, I hang out with all these crazy people who do the same thing. But um, but she's supportive of it. I mean, I think my, more of my parents were worried that I was going to go to England and drown. Um, but uh, I, I think they've gotten over that somewhat. But uh, but my wife's been supportive. It's uh, lately has been a lot of time swimming. That's we try to do other stuff in the summer, and I've always got to go swim somewhere. Uh, but usually we can work around things, and it works out fine. Question here. Oh, what do I think about all different things? So mostly, everybody asks me this. Um, mostly, I think about swimming, <laughs> uh, not drowning. <laughs> um, there's actually a lot to think about with with any open water event navigating uh, to be able to see where you're going. It's a little easier with a boat next to you, but I got about, you know, a split second where I'm catching the boat out of one eye to try to figure out how far away from, am I from this boat? Am I swimming in a straight line, staying with the boat? So I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about keeping my stroke efficient. And then I'm just thinking about all kinds of other weird stuff. I mean, during the channel, I was mostly thinking about how much, you know, as I was throwing up about failure and <laughs> how much this sucks right now. But um, and then at the end, I was thinking about, you know, trying to make it. So I, I was, you know, mostly concentrating on the swimming, frankly. Uh, the early part when I was feeling pretty good, I mean, it was really kind of peaceful when you get out there. And I actually kind of enjoy swimming in the dark and at night. Uh, it's really peaceful, usually on the water. Um, you have lights from houses and stuff on shore, uh, but you could see all the big container ships out there. They're lit up like a city. 
out in the water, and it seems like every one of them is coming straight for you. Uh, you see them out there, and it looks like every one of them's right at you. So, so it is kind of peaceful to watch that and be out there. Then, so yeah. Question here. Yeah, uh, yeah, Brian. Yes. Uh, I, I, I think of naval operations. I'm thinking of the sh the boat where Stacy is. I'm thinking of Paul. And you, what is the communication system in the, for what I'm talking yeah. about? So some people will use a whiteboard and write stuff on whiteboard to signal. Uh, the boat, the mate on the boat had a strobe light. And so he told me right away, like, this is where we want you to swim. I control the speed. So the boat captain actually has cameras mounted on the side of the boat that he can see me while I'm swimming. There's two captains, so one is driving the boat and taking care of the navigation. The other one is keeping track of where the swimmer is and communicating back and forth. And then the mate's job was mostly taking care of all my people on the boat, helping with feedings and stuff like that. But they had a strobe light. If I got too far away or too close to the boat, I'd see the strobe light flashing. Or if it was time for a feeding, they turned the strobe light on at night. During the day, they can just wave and signal to me to let me know kind of where they are. And then most of the communication is at the brief stops of, you know, stopping and they'll they'll tell me stuff I need to know and then back off swimming again. Um, so that's how most of the communication happens to me. Um, you know, the folks on the boat are talking, the uh, captain is talking to the um, kind of air traffic control, so to speak, of Dover and Calais, of uh, plotting their course across helping freighters navigate around us because we have the right of way going across. Um, so they're busy dealing with all that stuff as well. My question is about something you've done both of, saltwater and freshwater swimming. Do you have comparisons or? Yeah, saltwater, you're definitely more buoyant. Um, and that makes a difference for speed. Um, it's a little easier in that respect to swim in salt water, but then you obviously have to taste and all the salt, um, which was a problem for me. I think that was a big part of my nausea issue. You know, I'm not trying to drink a bunch of water as you go across, but you, when you're breathing, you, you get water in your mouth, you spit most of it out, but you end up swallowing and just absorbing, I mean, even through your, you know, skin and everything else, you're absorbing the salt water. Uh, which, you know, made me sick. Like I said, it made my tongue swell up and stuff. So I prefer fresh water over the two. Um, you're a little less buoyant in fresh water, but, um, you know, I just find it more comfortable to swim in for me. Um, and then there are more issues with electrolytes. Um, so like cramping and stuff, you, for a lot of sports things, you're sweating in the water, even when it's cold. Replacing those electrolytes is not really an issue with salt water. Um, the stuff I read said, don't take, any kind of salt pill. Um, I foolishly didn't listen to that and took ones that didn't have sodium and chloride, but had like calcium and magnesium. And uh, we bailed on those fairly early because I think that just made me more sick. Um, but you really don't need anything in salt water. But in fresh water, um, you have to have some electrolyte replacement as well. Nope. So really, you only get tides in the ocean. A lot of people think about tides in Lake Michigan, but it's really seiches where the wind blows the water to one side and the other like a bathtub. Um, so you do get changes in the water height, but you don't get a true tide in freshwater bodies of water. They're just not big enough, um, the, but the ocean does. So you don't have the issues with tides in, the, in freshwater. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, one is when you adapt your body to the cold water, how about your nervous system? Do you still think it's really cold? And then the second one is looking at the path that the that you swam. How does, uh, I guess a simple question is, why didn't the captain take you straight across? Yep. And, and at two miles an hour, that's pretty hard to keep that boat, you know, on track. There's the path. So, um... I forgot the first one already. <laughs> Adapting, yes. So does it feel cold? Um, you, you definitely get more used to it. Uh, it's a for me, it was a gradual process. I started swimming in the summer and then just kept swimming till it got too cold and it was uncomfortable. And then switched to the pool, and that was low sixties the first the first year. Um, the next year, when I first got in the water, um, it was around sixty and it felt just 
absolutely freezing. And in 2022, the year we went, uh, my coach had me go out and I, I think the water was colder. The buoy said 60, but I think it was colder than 60. And that felt just cold. And I swam about three miles. And at the end of that, I'm like, there's no way I'm making the English Channel because I was just dying in that 60 degree water. Uh, but over time, it does get to where it doesn't feel as cold. I always joke, you know, even when I jump in the pool at the aquatic center, it's 78 and it feels cold when you jump in. It's like the worst part of the practice is always is always getting in. You see all the swimmers standing, talking and avoiding jumping in. And then once you get in, you're fine. And it doesn't matter how cold it is. It could be 50, it could be 78. You don't want to get in unless it's a really hot day. But uh, but I will say that as I've swam in colder and colder water, it doesn't bother me as much. Um, I'm fine down to 60, um, probably 61, somewhere in there. But every degree after that is just exponentially colder. Um, and so to go from 70 to 60 is not so bad, but to go from 60 to 50 is very difficult. Um, so now I can get, like I said, I get down into the upper 50s and can swim pretty comfortably in that. When you get to the mid 50s, I need a wetsuit at that point. Uh, and I, I typically will wear one at that point because I'm not training for something that's 55 the whole way across. So I, it's more of a safety thing. I don't need to, to, to take that risk, essentially. Um, the track going across, I, you know, I wasn't in the boat to see where he's going, but I think essentially what he's doing is driving the boat. He's, I'm swimming straight the whole way. So I'm not swimming this way down this path. I'm swimming this way towards France. And the current is just pulling me sideways because the currents he's keeping their experts at the tide to know so they take when you start they want an estimate and you want to give them a good estimate of how fast you swim um, as close as you can get to your actual open water swim speed because they use that to decide where to make these turns some of these turns there's no choice because once the current picks up to a certain speed you're going you can't even if i was swimming you know totally the other way i can't out swim that current we're going to we're going that way regardless um it's just we're going that way maybe a little slower so i think they use that to kind of to figure out their direction of how far do we go left or right as we start out knowing what the currents are going to do and what my speed is to try to get me across at the right spot and i think more so it's the starting time on when do you start to go and where the wh what where the currents are or the tides are at that point in time to try to time it so you'll have kind of an equal tide going northeast and southwest to balance things off. Um, like I said, the, the boat captain will be able to answer that a lot better than I than I could, but. Um, but I think I, I know that they changed their course as we went part way across because that two and a half hours where I was throwing up, my pace slowed dramatically and that they had all planned out for where we're going to be at the end. And all of a sudden, if you change speed in the middle, it screws that whole plan up. Um, not so bad if you go fast, um, because you probably just end up, you know, in this bay a little bit more. Uh, but if you go slow, you can miss the point. And then when we sped up later, I was swimming much faster. I was swimming over four miles an hour at one point. Uh, and that wasn't me swimming that fast because I can't swim that fast. That's faster than an Olympic swimmer. It's the current assisting as it's pushing me and me swimming. So my total time going across, my total course, if you measured the, the, the course here, was 37 miles. And I finished it in just over 12 hours. So my average speed was three miles an hour. I swim at two miles an hour. And, you know, there's no way I swam that fast. Some of that was the current pushing me and the captains navigating that path. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. People cross and land all over the place. Um, so what would happen if I missed this point is that this would pull me out. So if I came along this trajectory, it would pull me out like this. And I'm trying to swim this way. So my course would end up kind of 
paralleling the shore until the until the tide turns or if I can make enough forward progress. But because of this angle, I mean, it's about the same angle as you see here, you can see it's pulling you out away from shore. And if you can't swim fast enough to go forward, you get stuck in the barrier there. But people land way over here in Calais, they land other spots. If you miss that point, you get sucked around, you're still trying to swim to shore. You don't come all the way back here, you end up landing over here somewhere. Yeah, and it's good, it counts. If you get too far and you get to the Calais shipping zone, that's when you have a problem because once you en enter the Calais exclusion area right around their port, you're done. They will not allow you to swim there and the captain will pull you out immediately um, because if you get caught there swimming, you're big trouble. So, yes. Yeah, um, in addition to your year-round swimming training, do you, yeah. have, do you have any dry land training yeah. or exercise that you need to do in interim times? So as I actually just picked this up recently, I do weightlifting uh, with a guy named Mike Landis in town. He actually coached Jim Dreyer, taught Jim Dreyer to swim, actually. Uh, but he kind of specializes in weightlifting for swimmers. He used to work with a lot of high school swimmers, still does with some. Um, so I work with him doing some dry land training. And then the rest of my training is pretty much in the pool. And I've done some, you know, just like sit-ups, core exercise stuff. I've been doing limited amounts of that for a while, but I've now got kind of a more regimented weightlifting program to try to gain more speed, essentially more muscle. Yeah. I have two questions. Great class, by the way. Um, did you ever feel as though you might lose consciousness the whole a part of the time when you're swimming? Yeah, uh, I never did. Um, that's always, I always tell people the most dangerous part of the whole swimming is when I'm out swimming by myself along the shore of Lake Michigan. I'm not so worried about getting sucked out to sea or whatever, because I can swim a long ways. That doesn't bother me so much. It's the, if you somehow lose consciousness, you're, you're done. There's nobody there to help you. Um, so that's probably the most dangerous that and getting run over by a boat is probably even more so, but, uh, but I've not had that where I felt like I was going to lose consciousness or anything. Um, you know, it, I always wonder what happens to the people who, uh, you know, the 10 people who died swim in the English channel and some other ones you hear about around the world that have things happen. Um, and I always, I'm always surprised with triathlons. Uh, a lot of triathlons now have gone to a roving start, uh, where you line up based on what time you are thinking you're going to finish in. And then they launch a group of people like every three seconds to spread people apart. But for years, triathlons were a mass start. A thousand people all get in the water together and you just get beat up. I get a bit punched in the face numerous times, kicked. Um, I did a swim a few years ago called um, the uh, Big Shoulder Swim in Chicago. They've been doing for years. And a guy, an older gentleman who'd been doing it for years, died. Um, had a heart attack or something. They don't know what, I think it was a heart attack. They think it was, but I always think in those situations, like, did they get, did they get knocked out? Did somebody whack them with their hand or something? I think for most of the people who, who die on these swims, um, you know, it's not a common occurrence at all. There's been, you know, thousands of people that have, you know, 2,500 that have crossed, but there's been, you know, well over that, probably 10,000 people that have tried, and there's been 10 people that have died going across. And I think most of them are cardiac events where they have an arrhythmia um, that happens and they lose conscious, consciousness from the arrhythmia. And that's why when we went across after what happened, so my, our, I don't go too much into it, but our friend Nick Hobson, who died swimming in the Cook, Cook Strait, uh, when my friend Paul went up and met his dad and talked to him, we hadn't really heard what happened. And he got more of the story. But one of the things his dad blamed was that they didn't have somebody watching him the whole time. They got to shore and they sent a kayak ahead to look for a landing spot. And he was briefly on his own. And that's when he disappeared. Um, and so one of the things we do whenever we go is there are two people on the boat that's job is to watch the swimmer. Um, that that their job is to watch the swimmer and be able to, ready to jump in if something happens, not like talking to each other and you know everybody looks every once in a while, but just watching the swimmer the whole time so that you can intervene if something happens. But you know the, the odds of that are pretty low, but but that's the precaution we take. 
uh, quickly, how did you happen to choose the course that you're going to be swimming across Lake Michigan? Yeah, so um, almost everybody who has done Lake Michigan has done the very southern tip. Um, all of the ones that are recognized swims have gone from, just about all of them have been Chicago to Michigan City, which is like 35 miles, which is a much shorter swim. Um, the uh, There's been one to Union Pier, which is just by Benton Harbor, uh, not Benton Harbor, um, just over the border here. And then the two swims by Ted Erickson and um, Abdul Heath, who went to Benton Harbor, that's the farthest one. But nobody has crossed in the middle other than Dreyer. And so it was appealing to me to do, when I think of a Lake Michigan crossing, you're crossing in the middle of the lake. It's not the very tip from one side to the other. Or you can, you know, a lot of people have crossed the Straits of Mackinac, which is four miles. Technically, you cross both Lake Huron and Lake Michigan both at once in four miles. Uh, but is that really crossing Lake Michigan? Um, the swims of Lake Superior, interestingly, um, all of the pe people think, oh, Lake Superior is the hardest of all the Great Lakes. All of the Lake Superior swims that are recognized swims went right here. Between Wisconsin and Minnesota, there's about a 12 mile stretch there. The water is more sheltered and more shallow. And so it's actually usually one of the warmer ones of the Great Lakes swims. And so the only person, so Dreyer actually crossed from Whitefish Point to Gargach, Gargantuan Bay, which has kind of been through here. He tried to cross through here initially and didn't make it, but he did make the Keweenaw to Isle Royale. And I, I kind of think the, the ideal swim of Lake Superior, if it's even possible, is to go from the Keweenaw to Isle Royale and then cross on land on Isle Royale and go from there to Canada. It's 45 miles here, and it's another 15 on the other side. I don't know that that's possible with as cold as Lake Superior is, but anyway. Other questions? Congratulations and thank you for a great presentation. Thank first you. of all, my question is, what were your swimming beginnings? Yeah, so I um, swam in a backyard pool as a kid. Um, always dreamed of, I remember watching the Olympics in 1984 and thinking, oh, I want to be an Olympic swimmer and then running out to the backyard pool and, you know, swimming like three laps and calling it good. <laughs> uh, I started uh, competitive swimming in middle school uh, at Hudsonville High School. Uh, swam there in middle school. Was not a stellar swimmer. Uh, you know, most of the guys are really good Did age group their whole life and then swam in high school. And uh, my first two years in high school, I wasn't, I was probably one of the slower guys on the team, but then I, you know, like most kids, you, you keep at it, you suck at first, and then you get better if you keep going. And uh, so I got progressively better and better. I, one summer, I swam over the summer, and that made a big difference. And uh, by the time I graduated, I was one of the better swimmers. I actually had seven of the 14 school records were, were mine um, for like a year, and then another kid beat them. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, in college, uh, I thought about swimming in college, but it takes a lot of time. And um, I kind of came to the realization that, um, you know, in, in uh, like football, if you're the best football player in your school in the last 30 years, there's a good shot you're going to play at a division one level and then, you know, maybe make a you know professional career or something. But there's a lot of spots for football. There's, you know, hundreds of professional football players in the country. In swimming, there are the top three in the United States, and then there's everybody else is kind of a nobody. Um, not to say that they're a nobody, but nobody knows them uh, because there are three spots for the Olympics every four years. And if you don't make the Olympics, nobody's going to know you. You're not going to make a professional career out of being a swimmer, uh, maybe a swim coach or something like that. But I quickly realized in high school, I wasn't going to be the Olympic swimmer. Um, and, uh, and even if I went off to college and, you know, tried to be good, I'd be practicing like crazy and I'd better off uh, working on a day job. Uh, and so did that and uh, did triathlons. Um, I worked at a pool, did triathlons through college. And then when I went to med school, I got too busy and basically didn't swim really at all for like 30 years until um, about three years ago when I 
had been kind of thinking about the English Channel for a long time and thinking I might want to do that. And COVID happened and I had some time and I'm like, I'm going to go swimming and see how it goes, see how I feel. And it felt pretty good. I felt like I could still swim all right and then went from there. Any other questions? Here's a question. I just wanted to say, um, this was very fascinating, but enough about you. Um, I think there were several pictures of your wife. Yeah. And she has the most amazing curly hair <laughs> I have ever seen. <laughs> it's It was gorgeous. You could clearly see she got it from me. <laughs> I wish I had a better picture of my son in here. Um, yeah, I know the one that I have in here, you don't see his hair. He's got a hoodie on. Uh, but he has the same curly hair, but like this long. It's just huge. We we used to tease him. We'd, when we'd cheer for him, we'd call him Chewbacca. <laughs> I'm, I'm told that it's time for us to wrap up. All right. But I have earned the right of the, the last question. Sure. We're talking doctor to doctor now. I had 30 years experience in sports medicine. I, you, it was very informative what you told me, how your tongue felt the next day. How about going from being flat horizontal to standing up for the first time? Yeah, well, you could see my experience of that when I got out um, that I had read just from the constant. So when you swim, part of being efficient is you want to, you, you're using your core muscles to help with your arms. So you're constantly rotating. Uh, you don't swim flat in freestyle. You're on one side and then you switch to the other side. You wanna stay on your side the whole time. You have less water resistance and it's better for propulsion. So you're constantly moving back and forth like this and the waves and everything else. So, um, you know, part of that I think is the standing up, but yeah, part of it, you've been horizontal the whole time and, um, Mostly I don't use my legs uh, with long distance swimming. So sprinters use a six beat kick um, where they kick six times every stroke, every cycle of strokes. Long distance swimmers usually do a two beat kick. You basically just use your legs to help spin your body from side to side. And so I don't use my legs much when I'm doing these long distance swims. And then all of a sudden you gotta use your legs, uh, you know, standing up. So definitely felt off balance and just, you know, stuff didn't work. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone.